या रियल लाइफ जी सर अस्सलाम वालेकुम दिस इज नौशीन अब्बास नकवी योर होस्ट असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर कैसबेट वेलकम यू ऑल इन दिस वेबिनार as you know that casbit is continuously arranging a series of webinar and inviting highly professional uh, personalities in the field of hr marketing supply chain finance islamic finance especially and the ultimate purpose of this webinar series to educate the students with the professional knowledge and to link between the uh, academic knowledge with the professional experience as well so we have arranged with the collaboration of the uh, cfo club today this webinar on the topic of islamic finance within global financial system and i am glad to announce you that uh, the founder of the cfo club mr shahzad didi is with us as a moderator of this program thank you so much sir for joining us uh before i would like to give a brief introduction i would like to welcome our honorable guest mr ayaz ahmed thank you so much sir for joining us and given us your precious time now i move to the brief introduction of mr ayaz although the profile is so long so mr ayaz ahmed has sound banking and business knowledge he has a strongly investment management experience of the asset management and hpl pickick asset management he has a strong fintech experience and work as a chairman of one link and as a director of cdc previously he attached with the hpl group and work as a cfo he also work as a director of many listed companies at national and international level as well he has sound and in depth knowledge of islamic financial system as well currently he is running his own business of rate in uk so now i move to the uh, mr shahzad for the further proceeding thank you so much sir thank you noshin thank you very much sabse pehle to bahut shukriya caspit ki team ka aur jaisa ki bahut sare logo ko pata hi hoga we have signed uh, an mou Uh, with Caspit University for joint projects, and uh, this uh, webinar series is just a step forward. So CFO Club is doing a lot of webinars since COVID times, and uh, we have done almost 70 webinars to date on different aspects, different topics. Islamic banking, jo hai, uh, first time we are doing anything on the banking, Islamic banking side. सो इसमें स्पीकर्स और ये इस पर हमने काफ़ी सोचा फिर अयाज साहब से बात हुई अयाज साहब का हमें जो एक मॉडर्न अप्रोच है एज अ चार्ट अकाउंटेंट एज अ बैंकर वो हम खुद भी समझना चाह रहे हैं और हम चाहते हैं कि आप भी देखें उस पर ना इम्पॉर्टेंट चीज़ जो है वो आज के सेशन के बारे में अयाज साहब जो हैं वो एक लंबे अरसे तक एक बैंकर रहे हैं डी एस पी न सी एफ ओ एंड सी टी ओ विद हबीब बैंक आई वॉज ऑल्सो फॉर्चुनेट uh to work under him in finance department of habib bank when i was there acha important cheez ke he has a detailed knowledge of finance and banking now sath hi sath unhone ek detailed research ki hai to initially jab icap mein bhi webinars hote the around 2003 ki baat hogi tab bhi ayaz sahab ne ye baat uthai thi aur hpl ne bahut sare actions jo hain jo ke us waqt jab liye the when i was auditor with hpl jab main pwc mein tha तो उसमें भी अयाज साहब से हमें सीखने को मिलता था नाउ अभी इस वक्त जो फाइनेंसिंग सिस्टम है फॉर्चुनेटली और अनफॉर्चुनेटली जो स्कॉलर्स हैं उनको बहुत अच्छी नॉलेज है जो आपके शरयी नॉलेज है दूसरी तरफ एक फाइनेंस प्रोफेशनल है जिनके पास शरयी नॉलेज नहीं है लेकिन उनके पास फाइनेंस की नॉलेज है दे अंडरस्टैंड आई आर एस वेरी वेरी बैड नाउ देर इज अ रिक्वायरमेंट विच आई फील दैट देर शुड बी एन इंटेग्रेटिव अप्रोच लाइक जो फाइनेंस प्रोफेशनल्स हैं स्कॉलर्स हैं वो मिलके बैठे हैं रिविजिट करें किस तरह से आज के दौर में मॉडर्न फाइनेंस इस्लामिक सिस्टम हो सकता है सो so, इस पे हम सुनते हैं अयाज साहब से एक डेढ़ घंटे की प्रेजेंटेशन है आफ्टर दैट वी विल हैव अ गुड क्वेश्चन आंसर राउंड तो प्लीज पार्टिसिपेट क्यू एन ए के टाइप में आप अपने क्वेश्चन लिखिए और इसके अलावा कोई कमेंट्स है तो हमें चैट में बताइए फेसबुक पे जो व्यूवर्स हैं वो अपने क्वेश्चन कमेंट्स में ही लिख सकते हैं So thank you very much Ayaz sir for joining us and uh, over to you sir 
Thank you, Noshin, and thank you, Shahzad, for this very kind introduction. Um, I'm fortunate to be able to speak to people on this forum, and uh, for that, I appreciate both Casper and the CFO forum. Uh, as Shahzad said, that um, I have a lot of uh, background knowledge and, and, and training. Um, one of the things that really hit me very early on when I interacted with our colleagues in finance and in the profession. He may even be the president of the ICAP, but his comment when I asked him about uh, Islamic banking and riba would be, "Ye to hume samaj nahi aata. I don't understand. We don't understand this." So that was the motivation that uh, got me thinking on how we can impart uh, and make this as an integrated part of our training and our understanding. So what I did was, was to go through uh, from first principles and inshallah today what you will see, this is not something that you will have seen before. So that is something that I would like to uh, 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 um, tell you that, um, that, that you will not have seen this before. Um, and, the, and the reason for that is that it's, it, 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 it really is uh, looking at it from, from the basics. So inshallah, inshallah, the idea of today is that you will be able to uh, understand and uh, at least get to this point where we will, we will say that it is not difficult to understand. And in my view is that Islam was never intended to be difficult to understand. It may be difficult to follow, I wouldn't uh, doubt that, but in terms of understanding it, shown, it should not be difficult. So inshallah, we will um, start this uh, session. Uh, I've tried, uh, previous sessions I've had, have, have, and because it's very detailed, uh, inshallah, but also very, very engaging. So hopefully you will not get bored. I have, I can promise you that anybody who has seen my presentations in the past, has come back and said, you know, we, we just uh, were, were engaged with it. So hopefully, inshallah, you will stay engaged. I, uh, it's a multi-dimensional approach. So, so it will challenge some of the things that you may have known. It may challenge things that you had never thought about. But in, 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 at the end of the day, hopefully, we'll all be able to uh, understand where Islam comes from on this topic. Now, this... Um, when you talk about Islamic banking, it's it's a vast topic. And because today is the first time that I'm interacting with everybody and time is limited, so I'm going to really just focus on defining riba and to understand riba because that is the core of the issue. So if you understand that, then we can all be very productive and we can all put ideas in and everything will work. Like as said at the first start of my presentation that if we have the chartered accountants president saying, I don't understand, uh, then we have a problem. Then it means we can never understand it and we will have to be bound by somebody's interpretation. So hopefully, inshallah, we will talk about riba only today. I have other uh, um, slides in which we'll, we'll talk about how to how to implement it, how to identify it. And there are lots of practical sessions which we can carry on if people find this one interesting. And inshallah, so, so today I think if anything I can get through is, is, is try and understand Riba and that's a core building block of Islamic finance. So if we can get this scrapped, I feel we've got a, uh, we'll make a huge progress. So what are we going to do? Um, we're going to review the Islamic injunctions on riba and compare them to modern finance and try and evaluate the nature of financial products. And then we try and understand how it interacts in today's uh, financial system. Uh, part two, which we will definitely not be able to cover today, but I have just put that there. We're then going to look at the legal system, the financial framework and so on and so forth. And we're going to then try and design if we can agree on the definition of riba, then we will design Islamic banking products with that definition in mind. So inshallah, we'll get through part one definitely today, but uh, I don't think we may reach part two, but then inshallah, there's a follow-up session that we can have to discuss that. 
Um, it is my personal view, and it does not represent the view of any organization, uh, but it is uh, based on my practical experience. And also, I have a very wide uh, skill set uh, from being an engineer to a CA, asset management to banking. I've also done supply chain with Unilever and, and run my own business. So it is a sincere effort to make a positive contribution. And inshallah, I keep an open mind. So if we have interactions and people come up with uh, suggestions, I'm happy to, to incorporate that into future presentations. And I start with the um, Quranic Dua. Oh my Lord, open my chest for me and make my task easy and make loose the knot from my tongue so that they may understand my speech. So all knowledge is with Allah, but uh, hopefully, you know, we will, we will be able to get some messages across. So why is it an integrated approach? And my message here is that, you know, we should not be reinventing the wheel. And we should use all our knowledge to achieve our objectives of following Islam. And the examples I've given here is that you won't, uh, there are things that, uh, theologists will do, and there are things that experts in the field will tell you. So if you ever want to identify the pureness of Islamic gold, you'll go to a chemist. Now you can go to a, a Sharia scholar and he will tell you what you can do with gold, whether you can have jewelry of gold, whether men can wear gold, how to trade gold. But if you ever wanted to test the pureness of a gold, you will not take it to a Sharia scholar. Similarly, if you want to evaluate the safety of a bridge, you will ask a structural engineer to do that task. Again, open heart surgery, a cardiologist. It's only our field of finance that we seem to have accepted that the people who can teach us are going to be the Sharia scholars. Now, there is a role for, for scholars, and that is to, to give the guidance, the, to explain what it means. But as far as the products and all of the actual practical part is, is with, uh, with our understanding and, and science. And often when you read the Quran, each time you get a different perspective on it. And Alhamdulillah, just last week when I was preparing this presentation, I found that Quran was actually talking about big data and facial recognition technology. And these two ayats that I got from Surah Rahman, it says, on that day, neither humans nor jinn will be asked about their sins. So what will happen? People will already be identified as the, uh, who are sinners and who are not sinners. And the disbelieving criminals will be known by the marks, especially on their faces, and seized by the forelock and the feet. So again, not only will they be identified, they will be actually labeled. So this is all about big data and God's system that he has managed with everything. So I'm again trying to say that Islam is all about understanding and you have to start. Now the beauty of Islam is that, yeah, and the Quran is that it was sent down 1400 years ago and it's our belief that it is forever. So every time that you read it, you should read it with the current knowledge. And inshallah, you will find new knowledge in that reading. And it is with that intention that I have said that when you listen to this presentation and the way I make this presentation, I'm deliberately going to ignore everything that we have known so far. And in a way, what you do is you look at it with today's knowledge and then see whether the Quran speaks to you, whether it gives you messages that it speaks to you. And, and, and I was inspired in the 80s by this uh, gentleman uh, called Doc, Dr. Bo uh, Morris Bakula. He wrote the book, the Bible, the Quran, and the science. Uh, and in, 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 I have a short presentation, about two minutes, but it's really fascinating to see that if you look at the Quran, as, even as a non-Muslim, the wisdom that you can find in it. And inshallah, the presentation will go on from that. So two minutes uh, of this. Uh,
जी अया सब स्टॉप हो गई है प्रेजेंटेशन अया सब आर यू देयर अया सब जी हम यहीं पे मौजूद हैं स्पीकर की कोई थोड़ा सा कनेक्टिविटी इशू है इंशाल्लाह भी हम ज्वाइन करें जी वेलकम बैक है सब ओके सॉरी फॉर दैट इट्स ओके सर यस प्लीज ज्वाइन सो वी शेयर इन दिस ओके ये बदल गया so um this is the the um uh uh situation that you can actually find yourself in if you've not even uh, uh been a muslim but when you read the quran and you try and relate it to modern world you will see a lot of wisdom inshallah from that inspiration you will now get to see how i am trying to connect modern finance with the reading of the quran and hopefully inshallah you will see that so what are we going to do we are going to review current islamic banking and look at finance in the light of quran and sunnah and really answer this very important question what is riba and that probably if we can do that today then you know we'll set the building block for future work and what i'm going to do is a review spanning 3000 years we're going to look at the quran and the hadith we are going to look at 15 years 1500 years before islam and we're going to use the proxy of judaism which was the knowledge that was uh, readily available at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then we're going to fast forward to 15 years 100 years after the the prophet islam was introduced and we're going to compare it to modern finance and ifrs so we're going to do a whole spectrum of review and the uh, best best to start of this is what does the quran say about riba and i've used uh, mizan's bank to islamic banking uh, they have published a very good book uh, which which uh, covers most of the things and so uh, authored by dr imran ashraf usmani and the reason i've used this is so that we minimize the dis discussion over whether these are facts that i'm saying or they're just uh, i'm selectively picking things up so i deliberately start with with it uh, from that book so that anybody who knows islamic banking knows mizan bank knows the the uh, usmani uh, views so therefore I'll, i'll start with that and actually there are only four places where riba is mentioned in the quran and three are given on this page and the fourth one is on the following page uh, in which it starts in surah al-rum and these are chronological order so the first revelation came in surah al-rum verse 39 and it said and that which you give as interest to increase people's wealth but that is not 
increase uh, seeking the goodwill of Allah multiple. So again, here it was just warning you, the first warning sign came in that there's something to look at called interest. Second revelation, Surah Nisa, verse 161. And for those taking interest, even though it was forbidden for them and their wrongful appropriation of other people's wealth, we have prepared for them uh, who reject face a grievous punishment. Now again, it was referring to the past uh, 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 people and in the, uh, that they were forbidden and yet they were still for taking interest. Then uh, comes the third revelation in Surah Imran. Uh, o believers, take not doubled and redoubled interest and fear God so you may prosper. So this is the first banning that comes in. Fear the fire which has been prepared for those who reject faith and obey God and the prophet so you may receive mercy. And then and the fourth revelation, which is uh, verses 275-281 of Surah al Bakra, which everyone um, which is aware of these. Um, um, uh, and the fourth revelation uh, is uh, 275. And here it very clearly says, those who benefit from interest shall be raised like those driven to madness by the touch of the devil. Now, and here again it says, trade is like interest, whereas God has permitted trade and forbidden interest. Um, so, and then it goes on. And we'll cover each of these later. But the key thing that I would like to, um, uh, 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 to, to discuss is how do you, how do you, um, uh, when you read this ayat, if you were somebody who was looking at it for the first time, how would you read it? And here it says, Riba eaters will get up on the day of judgment like someone driven to madness by the devil by his touch. This will happen because of their claim that profit on by or trading is the same as interest, whereas Allah has permitted by and prohibited riba. Now, when I read this, just note the la the tone of this ayah, the last part of this ayah. It says people claim that there is no difference between profit and interest. And it's strongly refuted and equated to madness. And Allah does not deny that there is or maybe similarity, but categorically says that the difference is clear and therefore not a matter of discussion. So it really is trying to say at that point to the people who came and said that it is different, uh, what's the difference, and try and confuse the matter. The answer came that the two are very clear. Don't try and confuse it. The two are very clear. One has been made halal, one has been made haram. And uh, Taqi Uswani, one of his uh, writings also said that uh, how could the Almighty, uh, all wise, all merciful declare war against a practice, the nature of which was not known to anybody. So this tells you that things must have been clear at that time. And, uh, and we, we take this theme forward. When you look at riba in hadith, and it says riba is only in lending, and there is no riba except in nasiyah, which is waiting, and there's no riba in hand-to-hand -hand transactions. So again, very clearly, the message is coming along that, that riba uh, is, is, is to do with waiting, it is to do with lending, and therefore, uh, it's, it, it, it's clearly giving that message. I'm going to share a few clips of what do the um, what do the Jewish uh, faith say about riba, and the reason I'm going to share this is because despite our impression that we think that we practice um, uh, interest as a, a very uh, you know a, a very uh, extensively, when you listen to this, you will realize that what was and the idea of this particular set of present uh, clips is to say what was the knowledge that was prevalent at the time of the prophet. So we will be able to understand that when we understand this. He, we can hear you. So we were on yesterday, well, this is mitzvah number 68, and this is a very, very important mitzvah because it, it has practical uh, record ramifications for us. And it is the bit so that you're not allowed to be involved in an interest loan. You cannot lend with interest in Torah. Now, 
before we even talk about let's get back to the 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 idea of let's first talk about the the what the, what the halachic uh, limitations are just to get a, a framework. Uh, um, the Torah says you're not allowed to be involved in an interest law. Now, an interest law means you're not allowed to lend to a Jew with interest. We're allowed to lend to a non-Jew and you can take from me that Jew. This will explain why. But you are not allowed to lend to a Jew with interest. Now, what this does is it creates certain technical problems because if I want to borrow money, you see, if I want to borrow money from you, I want to borrow $10,000. Now, the normal uh, mindset is, well, why should I like you make money with my money if I could make money with my money? And it's only logical you should pay me interest. It's a very logical system. You see, the whole world works like this. And nobody views the world as being evil for lending an interest with interest. That's expected. Like, why should I mean, you need my money to invest? You want to borrow $10,000 to invest in a business. I'm talking about a guy who's poor. Talk about a guy who wants to invest in a business. You want to, you need ten thousand dollars. What are you planning on doing? Plan on making money, right? So what are you going to make money? You're going to make money with my money. But if I didn't lend it to you, so I can invest my money and make money. So it's only logical, okay? So why can't you? So the Torah says, well, I'll have to do that. Even if they offer it to you, and even if they call it anything by any other name, even if they call it, even if they call it, uh, I don't mean ten thousand dollars. I give you a two thousand dollar gift. In two months, or he says, Here, I'll give you a two thousand dollar gift. Uh, six months from now, I want to borrow ten thousand dollars. That's what the Gemara says. You can't do that, it's interest by any other name, no matter what you call it or what you call it. Remember, I told you what happened with, with my brother when I flipped him. That's exactly the point. And so, that's exactly the point. When you lend something without interest, you're going to lose. I could have made money on it, and I'm losing. I'm not allowed to charge you to cover that. That's it because that's 100 percent interest. But you can say, I don't want to lend you the money because I get the money in. So again, if it's a poor person who really needs the money, it's always a mitzvah to lend people money. But if I'm using the money and I'm going to make money, I can't lend you money. Now, there is a way around it. Again, you're nothing. A service charges interest by any other name. That's what a service charges. Exactly the point. Anything that you call it. I will, I'll show you how complicated it is. Again, your first name is Kevin. So we're going to ask him that. Let's see. Okay, so that was the definition of 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 uh, riba in the Jewish faith, and, and almost that's the proxy for what the knowledge would be with the Muslims at that time. So anything by any name that is connected with a loan is interest is riba. Now I fast forward fifteen hundred years. So that was going back fifteen hundred years from the Prophet's time. I fast forward fifteen hundred years. And what do we get? We get the Bible of modern accounting, which is IFRS. And it consists of, I don't know, how many thousands of pages and it's constantly being updated. But interestingly, in the preface of the IFRS, gives the definition of debt and equity. And equity is the residual interest in the assets of the uh, entity after deducting all its liability. Now, the residual interest, this is not the interest of, uh, there are three meanings of interest. The first one is, are you interested in this topic? Inshallah, we're all interested in this topic. That's why we're here listening to it. Second uh, definition of interest is, do you have an interest in it? I.e., is it going to affect you? Is it going to be affected? So inshallah, again, it is going to affect us because we are Muslims and we believe that interest is to be considered uh, uh, haram. And therefore, we do have an interest in knowing about it. And the third is interest, which is the payment of the extra amount, which is interest. So, but this residual interest is the second one when you have an interest in something. So it's an interest in the assets after deducting all this liability. And the way I do this mathematically, I read this this uh, this line, and it it comes out that it's mutually exclusive. If it's one, it's not the other. And now you look at this definition and you go back to that Quranic ayat that I was quoting from where Allah said one is one, the other is the other. Don't mix them. Even IFRS today is saying exactly the same thing. So that is the wisdom of the Quran that 1400 years ago it declared the two to be very clearly defined and no confusion. And even today, with all our modern finance, that is a basic uh, uh, issue that, that remains. And that cannot be wished away. 
And that is a very important message of today. If you can get that in the Quran, when it said one is uh, halal, one is haram, but before that, it tried to explain that there is no discussion on it. This will get in a fart saab zahir and wazeh. So don't try and confuse it, because if you try and confuse it, uh, it, it was very badly dealt with. And then the IFRS says any increase in debt due to debt is interest. And any other increase, you get profit. And the reason I am, any has been put in bold because that's what the IFRS is today. It doesn't talk about a rate, it doesn't talk about any amount, it doesn't talk about anything. It says, if you get return on a loan or a debt, it is interest. So, and that's exactly what the Quran and the Sunnah that I've quoted, where the Prophet said, don't take any benefit against a loan. So exactly the two are 100% matched and therefore, we should feel very comfortable with what Islam says because it's exactly based on what we understand as the modern finance. And you will see this theme, no conflict between Islam and modern finance. It's coming through my presentation time and time again because that is the message when I'm talking about integrated. If you can see that the message is the same uh, or the things that are being talked about are, are the same, then we can all feel comfortable that we can understand this, uh, Islamic finance. Again, looking at the Quran, it says, O believers, fear Allah and give up what is due to you from the interest. And if you want to, if you repent, yours is the principle. So the principle is clear. Anything excess is the interest. And there is no discussion about uh, the, 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 the little amount is okay, too much rate is going to become usury. There's no question of that. Any amount above the principal will become interest under IFRS. It will become riba under um, uh, Quran. And look at what uh, the Jewish are saying also on the same. There's, there's something called uh, a ribis glory. You can't even say something to somebody that you wouldn't normally say if not for that. That, 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 that he lent you, that he lent you the money. The Gemara says, uh, 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 if, if, if somebody comes over, if you lend me money. Now, according to the Gemara, when you lend me the money, by the letter of the law, I'm not allowed to say thank you, because then I'm giving you more than I'm paying you back, plus a thank you. So the post can say, if we are people who say thank you for everything that's given to us, we are decent people, say thank you, so you can say thank you for the law. You can't say thank you effusively. Wow, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Wow, this really saved me. I can't, you can't imagine it because then I'm paying you interest. I'm giving you gratitude, which is above this called Ribbon's Door. You cannot do that. You're not allowed to do anything. If you lend me money and I pay you back, I can't let you stay in my rental apartment for free. I have an apartment that I rent out. I'm not allowed to let you stay there for free or even less than what I normally charge because the money that you're saving becomes interest on the loan. Right? That's, that's how complicated I'm just going to go ahead Okay, so hopefully, when after this two or three slides, I hope I've addressed people who keep thinking that there's something different about usury than interest. That is a concept that does not exist, neither in modern finance, nor in Islam, nor in Judaism 3000 years ago. So, If anything, I would like people to get that clear message. There is no such thing as usury, which is different from interest. It may be a subset of interest. It may be a high rate of interest, but it is still covered under interest. And again, I've said here, no conflict between Islam and modern finance. Then people say, well, what if I agree and we all agree, then what is the problem with interest? The point is that when you live in a legal framework, Every society has legislation. For Muslims, it comes from the Quran and the commandments of Allah. But the key message is that individuals cannot make legal what is illegal by mutual consent. That is a, a, a modern uh, accepted legal uh, uh, paradigm. It's exactly what Islam says. And uh, again, I will share. By the way, it's prohibited even if we both agree to it. Even if we both agreed to the loan, you said to me, let me $10,000. I said, well, I don't, I won't, because I, I want to, I, I don't want to lose, I won't get anything. You say, you're willing to pay me, you'll pay me 6% if you plan on making more money. 
And then, well, if you're willing to pay me, Zalda, what could be wrong with it, right? And the answer is you can't do that. The answer is you can't do that. I can't lend you, even if you, the borrower, are happy to pay me interest, you're not allowed to do that. I'll get to you once again. So, so the, the, the question becomes why? So again, it is not a choice that you have. The commandments are there, the law is there, and you cannot legally make it uh, that uh, interest can become halal just because we agree to it. However, if you if legal things can be made, uh, limit them when you go into a contract. And that is, uh, so the main thing to take from this slide is that it's not for us to argue why a law is in place. The key point that we have to understand, is the law clear? And is there any confusion on the law? And inshallah, what I'm trying to show is that there is no confusion on the law. Okay. Now, I hope everybody have understood where I'm coming from, that the Quran is by clearly saying something which is totally in compliance with current IFRS and what was being said at the time of the Quran already was already been said 1500 years to the uh, Jews before that. So there's a whole spectrum of, of uh, consistency. So if we say we don't understand it, then there must be something that we uh, are, uh, uh, we need to ask ourselves why we're saying that if we don't understand it. The other thing that people get very confused about is Rebal Fadl. And there are two types of Rebal, the Shunya scholar will tell you, one is Rebal Masiya, which is, uh, or Jahiliya they call it, which is the straightforward interest that we know. And then there is this Rebal Fadl, and this is the Hadith that is again quoted from the Mizan book, page 57. And this is where it is defining what types of trade are okay and what types of trade generate riba. Alhamdulillah, I read this and I suddenly realized so much wisdom in it. And I shall take you through the next two slides, which will show you why these trades have been identified as, as, as uh, interest bearing. So if I go and just literally reading the Hadith, I have put in um, the, the slide green and red. So if you look at it, it says very much that you can only do for uh, all these trades the last line. However, sell gold for silver anyway you please on the condition it is hand to hand and barley for date on the condition that is hand to hand. So basically it's saying that, you know, on a deferred basis, actually nothing is allowed. Now, this is a big statement I'm making, I'm aware, and I'll come back, uh, we'll look at it. Then on the, the other side, what you cannot do is, is on homogeneous uh, products, uh, uh, you, you can't do different quantities. Now, this is what is the interpretation here. Then what I do is put modern finance alongside it. What does it mean when you deal homogeneous and heterogeneous. Basically, homogeneous means the same goods. So if you're giving rupees, you get rupees back. You're giving dollars, you get dollars back. You give dates, you get dates back. So the transaction is to do with homogeneous uh, trans uh, items. And that those are the items that are basically, it becomes a lending transaction. If you do in heterogeneous, i.e. Like different products, then it's, a, it's not a, a lending transaction. And here you can see that when you deal in homogeneous products, which is deferred with a delay, and you try and do different quantities, it actually becomes an interest loan. So it's like giving dollars and getting dollars back, but getting an additional amount of dollars. If you do different things, Effectively, you say that I'm going to sell you a car on a, on a credit, then effectively that credit to Islam to me says you cannot do it. And look what the modern finance is all about, it's saying this is trade plus credit. And because it's credit, you're not allowed to make any money on the credit and therefore it's, it's not allowed. Um, there are a couple of events which I've said are non-events, and you can under, try and understand what I'm saying there, that you would never do a transaction which is um, 
uh, you know, give the same amount, 100 rupees, and someone gives you 100 rupees back. Same time, you know, so it's not, it's not a transaction that's going to happen. And similarly, uh, you know, you won't have a situation where you give two cars and get two rupees in, in, in two months' time. So these are non-event stuff called them, that these are transactions that are going to happen. But the key point of all of this, when I look at this, it's very consistent with what modern finance is saying. So ribbon funnel, um, if, if the message I can give is that it is talking about transactions, uh, transactions that include interest and therefore it's banned. Now, IFRS 15, for example, also says that you have supplier credit, you need to segregate supplier credit on IS, IFRS 16, you've got, you've got, uh, you've got uh, rental, but in that you've also got financing uh, arrangements, so you need to separate it. So IFRS is also saying the same thing that the bulk firm is saying. Hopefully it's complicated, I understand, but if someone's got more time, we can spend more time on it. But the message here is again, very much the consistency between Islam and uh, modern finance is, is very much there. Now, what makes a bank a bank? And it's different from other types of financial entities. Now, most people think banks lend money and therefore they're banks. So let me say that again. Most people think that banks are banks because they lend money. They finance, they're in the financing business. Actually, that's not the answer. The answer was given by the Bank of England governor. And as you know, uh, British uh, uh, Bank of England is you know, one of the most modern uh, entities in, in banking. And this typically governor came to Dubai to Islamic banking conference and he answered that question. He said, a bank is somebody who pays, promises to repay the principal of the depositor. So you become a bank, not because you're a lender, you become a bank because you are a borrower. And if you were not a borrower on this side, then you would not be a bank. And that's the key point that he was trying to make, that you will only become a bank, you only need to be a bank if you are borrowing money from the customer. So that's the key point that if you promise to pay the principal back, you become a borrower, a debt is created and a liability is created, and then you become a bank. So this again is something that is, I think most bankers even will not understand this uh, uh, very serious difference that you become a bank, not because of your lending, but because of your depositor relationship. So uh, we talked about this, the definition of a loan, a loan is where you're exchanging the same item with a time lag. So, and because, uh, because the banks do that, they take deposits in and they promise to give the same amount of deposits uh, money back, they become a loan, it becomes a loan and then you become a bank. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail later. What I've done is I've tried to summarize the hierarchy of transactions that we all, uh, uh, so that you can sort of get a focus on the types of transactions that exist. And you can either have an asset-based or a service-based transaction. And if it's a service-based transaction straight through, you will end up with a service or a fee or commission. Um, it will be a service. Now on the asset-based, you can either have two types of transactions. You can be a permanent transfer, or a temporary transfer. If it's a permanent transfer, within that you can either have spot payment or you can have deferred payment. And if you have a temporary transfer, you can have consumption by the recipient or non-consumption by the recipient. And if it's not being consumed by the recipient, it will either be utilized by the holder or it will not be utilized by the holder. And based on that, I have written down exactly the type of transactions that are generated. So a permanent transfer of an asset on spot payment would be a pure sale. A permanent transfer on a deferred basis would actually say would be a sale with credit. Consumption by if it's consumed and then has to be returned because it's a temporary transfer, it will be a loan. 
and so on and so forth. And then what I've tried to do is give the, the, the modern finance version of where that income relating to those transactions fall. So again, you can see the two areas where we have a problem. One is a loan, which is interest. And you also have a sale with credit, which is a profit with interest. And this is where IFRS 15 looks at this part. And um, so, because there is some confusion on how much of it is sale and how much of it is interest. Now, based on this, what I did was I said, okay, so far what I've explained is that riba and interest to me are the same. Now, this is counterintuitive for most of, of, uh, of the Luma and Muslims because we think they're two different things. So I put out a challenge to the mind to, 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 to every scholar and, and banker that I know. I said, let's analyze this in a simple Venn diagram where you have riba and you have interest and you try and see where they overlap and where they differentiate. So we, are, we have some examples to work with. So I said, okay, scenario one is that you have stuff in this zone here, which is neither interest nor riba. And you've got, you know, all the traits that we, we recognize. Then I said, it's also very clear that riba and interest are also, uh, you can take a loan, uh, bonds, mortgages, etc. That's also clear. Now to try and see if we can understand any difference, I asked the question, I said, give me any examples of riba that you, that Islam thinks is riba and the West does not call it interest. And this challenge has been out there for six months and I have not had a single example of substance that allows me to fill this, this box. And that should be an eye opener for people that interest and riba are synonymous. They're the same thing. There is no difference and there's no confusion. So when anybody says to me, I don't understand riba, then my question is, do you understand interest? And he will tell you everything about interest through IFRS and through all definitions, through legal cases. And all I'm saying is, if you understand interest, riba is the same and very thing. And I'm, and I'm still challenging people if they can give me an example that fits into this category. We have another category which is called interest, but not riba. And interestingly, there's lots of examples of that. And that is because we want to start calling some of the stuff that best calls interest as not riba. And in future, uh, later on, I'll talk about that. But really the concentration is to see is that anything that, the, that we are calling riba under Sharia that is not interest. And that's the challenge that I have to get anybody to come back and give me an example. So that challenge is open to all the CFOs out there as well and bankers, everybody. So if it's that simple and it's the same and it's clear, then where's the issue? And there is an issue. I'm not saying there isn't an issue. It's because, uh, and uh, what Pratap said, remember the message on, on, on Riba came right at the end of uh, the prophet's life. And there was people who were saying that it hasn't been explained clearly. I wish it had been cleared. And there are hadiths that say Riba will go around Riba will make transactions, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a task to be done. I'm not saying it's all done, but the fact is that it's simple. So let's listen to how the, the, the Jewish community sees if there is any uh, One thing, you know, Allah Allah says, I can't give my money to Mr. Fogel. Let's say, not Mr. Fogel, let's say there's a nine Jew. Dave asks me for a loan. I don't want to lend Dave, Dave without interest. So Dave's willing to pay me. So, you know, I do. I give it to the nine Jew. I say, hey, Tony, do me a favor. Lend the money to Dave. And then Dave pays back the nine Jew. So he just acts as the, as the middleman so that we can get around it because you're allowed to lend the nine Jew. I'm giving it to you to lend to him. He's going to pay you back to give to me. Or they can't do, they can't give their money to that Jew to then claim that the money's coming from that Jew. All this shtick, all this shtick because you're involved with money. So all the shtick, the, the Gemara heads us off at the past. 
It says it. You're not allowed to do it. And by the way, this is regarded as the single most difficult chapter in all Shas. The single most difficult chapter of Shas is what's called Ezu Neshech in Tractate Bab Metziah. It's the fifth chapter of Bab Metziah. That's regarded as the most difficult uh, chapter in all of Shas, which has to do with, with, with interest. And then because it gets very, very complicated. So you're going to come back more later. We didn't know that it was bridges. And you do learn that you shouldn't have done that. You become a collector. Just you just collect what you have. Yeah, you just know you do not collect interest. You do not collect interest. You collect, you, you collect, you have to let go back. So, again, we all agree that it is complicated. There is a lot of work to be done. And, and, and um, the, um, uh, even in the Jewish faith, they, they understand that there is complexity in it. And that's why you have so many IFRSs, I think. Okay. So, what are the what are the areas that we need to look at so that we can understand structured finance? So basically, we think um, uh, we're going to talk about contracts, we're going to talk about market-based pricing, connected transactions, because at the simple level, we, we understood that there was no difference. Where's the difference arising is when you're getting into structured finance. You're looking at uh, ways of, of, of bypassing, as he said, you give it to somebody else, somebody else gives it to somebody, and, and then I get it back. Is that halal? Is that acceptable? And these are the things that complicate it because we are all so keen to find workarounds on this topic that we are not willing to accept the basic that it's not halal. So we want to work around. So I'm going to challenge some of the workarounds and to try and explain how IFRS challenges those workarounds how, how, uh, and need to do the same. One topic before I get to that, people start thinking that cost of equity is the same as cost of funds. You know, they think it's the same concept. It's actually not. It's a totally different uh, beast. Cost of fund arises from a liability on an organization. Cost of equity is a misnomer. It's not the cost. It's the amount of shareholder expectation that he expects to receive when he comes on board. There's no liability on him. He can walk out anytime, he can come in anytime. It's his free choice. It's not a liability. And that is the point The uh, cost of equity is a pricing mechanism. I have a certain amount of money. I can choose what I want to do and that becomes, and if I want to get people in, I need to give them an expectation. And this misnomer comes in because people who are in majority shareholder tend to think of the minority shareholder as a cost as a uh, as a um, as a cost whereas no shareholder is a cost they're all uh, doing that. the other thing is that what is market value market value is the sum of discounted cash flows and then you minus that from the book value you get goodwill now a simple example of that is that if you go to a shop and you buy one um, so, uh, one kilo of atta, he'll tell you it's five rupees, you buy more things, he'll tell you it's 200 rupees, whatever. Then you say, I want to buy the shop. Will he sell you the shop at the total of the stock value? No. He will want a pretty goodwill, premium, whatever word you want to use. And Islam doesn't have a problem with that because goodwill is something which is to do with not buying that stock but buying future cash flows. So buying future future cash flows, expected cash flows, is not prohibited in Islam. It doesn't say just sell what's on your in your shop and the guy wants to buy the whole shop, you only have to sell in the, the physical assets and that's it. No. So what I'm saying here is that you you have the notion of businesses, cash flows, uh, revenue being generated and you discount those revenues based on your choice but it is not a liability and that's the key difference and this is a buzzword that i have just coined up in the last few months goodwill is god's will and when you look at market value minus book value which is equal to goodwill or purchase it's halal and there's no debt here 
there's a lot of uncertainty. Will the cash flow materialize? Will the business uh, be set up uh, in competition? Will a new uh, product come into existence? But there's no ambiguity when you're selling. You know what you're buying. You know what you've sold. And it's about belief in Allah who will create so much from nothing. And there's no dependence on fellow man for interest. So again, when you look at it, Allah is permitted by Edward. And that's the message that don't confuse cost of equity and goodwill, all of those concepts with interest. One of them arises from a liability and one arises from equity and the two are different. Uh, sorry, this slide should have been a, a bit uh, in the earlier one where I was talking about Rival Fadal. And what we're saying is that uh, it, uh, there can be riba. It, there's no riba in trade, but there can be riba in trade arrangements or contrived trades. So that's the message that I have there. Okay. So quick, now we, um, I'm going to try and rush through it because there's a lot more material, but hopefully the message is coming across loud and clear that, that there is total consistency of the Quran and the Hadith with what we are seeing in modern finance today. So we should be able to relate to all of those. Now contracts, um, they're enforceable by law and include promises and implied contracts. And the more detail in a contract, uh, the detail in the contract reduces as trust increases, market practice is established, volatility is reduced, and the time period becomes shorter. So you can walk into a shop, pick up a, a, uh, uh, a box of uh, biscuits, you go, you give the money to the, to the shopkeeper and you walk out. Now, where's the documentation? There's no documentation. Where's the confusion? So everything has already been defined. The price is written on it. You, you, the fact that you're going into a shop, you're, all, you're already committing the fact that I'm going to buy something. So contracts have a much wider meaning. You don't only read what is physically written at a, at a particular time. And Islam also says the same thing. It says Amal is based on Niyat. So if you're going into a shop to buy something, that Niyat is starting to define your contract, your relationship. And Islam requires clear and honest documentation. And it says here, when you deal with each other, write down those obligations in writing and let us subscribe, write it down faithfully between the parties. Now, faithfully means honestly, justly, equitably, whatever you want to do. But in effect, it is saying write down what is the reality of the contract. Again, there's no conflict between what Islam is saying and all of modern legal uh, laws. The other thing that we, so uh, the other thing that what happens is that people tend to, build their products, Islamic products, and violate this basic principle of market pricing. And, um, uh, you know, we, we as auditors have been taught from the very beginning that if you ever see off market pricing, question that first, because there's bound to be something unusual behind it. And those questions, uh, and because it's impossible for a business to offer off market prices and to remain in business. Because if he's selling expensive, he will run out of customers. If he's selling cheap, he will run out of suppliers. So the notion of being able to sell, and this is something that our Islamic banking products constantly say, that's not a concept that, that works in business. It has to be related to the market price. And if you find an off-market price, you've got to go and ask, is it misrepresentation? Is there exploitation? Is there under invoicing? Are you giving a bribe? Someone? So I asked this question to one of the top Sharia scholars in the country that I sell a product which costs me 800 rupees for a thousand rupees in my shop. A shopkeeper comes along and I give it, I sell it to him for 50 rupees. Is that a bribe or is that a trade? And unfortunately, the answer that I was given by the top Sharia scholar is that Now, if we are willing to accept that 
selling something that is a thousand rupees for 50 is not a bribe, then we've got to ask ourselves that we're missing something very big here. We shouldn't be talking about Islamic banking. We've got to be talking about basic, uh, uh, you know, morality, basic uh, legality, and the modern, uh, you know. So, so that's how you need to look at it and, and, and be very, very challenging on any of the products that are coming up with off-market pricing. And again, the Quran and Sunnah are very clear on it. Market price sanctity is paramount in Islam. The last of its past. So let this for for this let the competitors compete. The Quran says, eighty three twenty six, and the Prophet said that you know uh, if you don't want to, uh, you must keep the market price verified and and and, and constantly be checked. So again, it's a concept that Islam has. And we try and, and, and override Islam in trying to get our uh, enthusiasm for trying to create some products. Uh, again, the third concept is linked transactions. In, this, in uh, contemporary uh, finance, we call them connected transactions. And in Islam, again, there's a very clear concept that two transactions cannot be in one. So either it'll be one big transaction with lots of parts, or there will be two separate transactions. You cannot have them linked and still say they're two separate transactions. And what will make them connected is, is that they will not be done separately. Not that they cannot be done separately. You, all transactions can be done separately. But the question is now with these pricing, what are you, what are you actually buying and selling? So you have to look at it on a case by case basis. Just to give a quick example of what I'm trying to say here is that. If, uh, if an item for sale, let's say a glass is available for 100 rupees, can I sell it for 1100 rupees? And most obvious answer is no, I can't. But there are two situations in which I can, and I'm going to discuss those now. One, I can include a free gift of a thousand rupee note with the glass, and I can sell it for 1100. But that doesn't make the price of glass 1100. But the market value of glass plus the thousand rupee note will be eleven hundred. So yes, if you connect transactions, you can have a, a different price. And the other way is to promise to buy it back at twelve fifty. So the buyer is no longer interested in, uh, in the glass. He's, he knows he's only going to keep it for a very short period and return it back to me. So he's only now interested in the resale price. And then his question is, yeah, so he's starting to look at the credit worthiness of that transaction. So again, mixing transactions, building on the basis of transaction, you have to keep the basics of Islamic uh, finance principles, Islamic ethics into account. So you cannot ignore these when you start to build Islamic products. I've got some examples here. I'm going to just, uh, in science, you'll find that there are lots of examples of where different products when you combine them, they give you totally different tasir. They give you totally different impact. So, ye jo cheez hoti hai ki ye halal hai, ye halal hai, dono ko mehsaat kar dunga, ye bhi halal ho jayega. That is what I'm challenging here. Don't be misled into thinking A plus B, two plus two is you know you know the answer. You have to analyze it in a lot more detail. Um, okay. I'm going to rush because I want to just make sure I cover everything uh, and then we'll have some time to, to, to question and answer. Again, in finance, when you will see, it's the same products. You've got car rental model, I say. You've got a car manufacturer, you've got a driver, you've got an owner, you've got a financer. But the product changes as you, uh, time period changes, as the amount of commitment changes. And it moves from being a taxi to being a higher car hire from Avis to being a higher purchase finance lease. So the same ingredients will give you different answers. So don't, don't get confused the ingredients to my so much I also understand the answer. Similarly, spot effects, forward effects will give you FX swap, which is actually an interest product. Purchase of sales, share of sales will give you repo, which is an interest product. 
So two uh, transactions will, will give you something totally different. Okay, so how do you identify whether it's a debt product? Uh, I'll leave this now for next time. I don't think I need to go through because I think. Um, okay, uh, supply credit. Now, people think that one of the solutions is to to, to for the shopkeeper to buy the stuff and to sell it on long credit. Now that is generally not possible in modern finance. And therefore it's something that is not a solution to this problem of Islamic finance. And Ribal Fadal examples that I gave prohibited you going for long credit. And the reason for that is that if you look and you try and uh, try and sell a product with a long-term uh, credit, it's going to be, um, by definition, you will have to price it at trade. You cannot price it as a debt product. And that's the reason why you will not be able to do that. And you can see that in our, um, in our financial uh, uh, world, where you've got companies that are doing both, like General Motors or Samsung, if they're leasing uh, 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 assets, they will actually have a, either a separate subsidiary or a separate group within the company. And that will have its own balance sheet, its own cash flows, its own profit and loss. So the two businesses cannot be mixed up. Remember the Purani Kaya? The two are different. You cannot mix it up even if you want to. God has said that. IFRS says that. And there's no confusion about it. So, of course, people can always find exceptions. There are one exception on which we try and then base our whole industry. I say, let's take care of the 99%. And then if you find a few exception, exceptions, we can discuss them. But let's try and get the big picture going. People keep claiming that asset-based financing, uh, Islamic finance is asset-based finance. This is not an essential element of Islamic finance. As I showed when you are trying to buy goodwill, it has no, nothing to do with the current assets. It has got nothing to do with the physical assets. You're talking about future cash flows and people are absolutely willing to pay money for that. Similarly, services, et cetera. So, It's nothing to do with assets. Uh, that is a, can be one possibility within the, the spectrum, but there's no reason that Islamic finance should limit itself to asset-based financing. Because even if you look at America, many times they've had the property crash where people who thought they had assets are suddenly of nothing. So asset-based financing is not a driver of Islamic finance. Islamic finance can cover everything without it being asset-based. Now, why does debt become an issue? Now, ultimately, at the end of the day, my view on it is very simple. Something is prohibited. Uh, we may not understand it, but if it is clearly prohibited, we have to accept it. But still, there are some people who want to uh, discuss uh, why it is prohibited. But, and the Quran actually says in Surah Nisa 161, that you are wrongfully appropriating other people's property through this method. And the Quran says that you're eating into the wealth of others. So what I'm going to show you in the next uh, five, seven minutes is, is again the Jewish interpretation of it and then the IFRS interpretation of it. Problem number one is that it's called interest, it's called ribis, it's called uh, deshech. It bites because often what happens is when you take a loan with interest, you yourself don't realize because they throw all sorts of complicated numbers, you know, both three and a half percent compounded at, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then actually, you know, you own more money than you ever borrowed to begin with, right? So it quickly, it's called a, a neshech because compared to a snake bite, when a snake bites and injects venom, there's well, there may be two little puncture holes, but the venom gets in there, next thing you know, the whole body swells up. That's what a loan is. It's, it's, it's a the loan. The next thing you know, you owe more money uh, than you can possibly imagine. So first of all, the first thing is you have to be compassionate. Don't. So again, the same issue. The, uh, the, the debt has a problem of, of actually eating into other people's wealth. 
And I can do a very simple example in that, uh, you know, a, a class 10 accounting student can, um, can follow. Uh, if you take two partners who want to start a business and they agree that uh, we do 50 50 profit sharing, and in another case, the partner is saying, I'm risk averse, I just want 10%, and, and you keep the rest. They both put in a thousand dollars at the start. The business is not extreme. Look, you're just getting uh, profits of 300, 200, 100, a couple of losses. And they even managed to sell the business at the same price that they bought it at. Two, two people put in a thousand, they sold the business for 2000. So here's a simple example where all you've done is in eight years made, uh, made a profit. You did not lose any money on selling the business, and it's not wildly um, fluctuating profits. It's you know ROE of fifteen to, to um, plus or minus fifty percent. So it's a very simple example, and happens all the time in the restaurant industry in Pakistan and and the world. But interestingly, if you look at these two examples of partner A and partner B. If you move away from profit sharing to the debt model, and only at 10% interest, we're not talking about a lot of interest, what happens? In eight years, partner 2B uh, has been wiped out. Whereas on a profit sharing, both were sharing equally. Now, of course, people say if you put in different numbers, then part the profit, uh, the guy with the profit. Uh, in another example, they could maybe make a di uh, different combination. But the point I'm just trying to show here is that once you fix it, it becomes a liability for the other party. And therefore, it becomes quite a drain on that individual. And then what do we do when we want to think that cost of debt is lower? Yes, it's lower in the sense that it is lower. But what do we do? We try and make bring in security over and above what is your share. And that's where you, you uh, so when you look at collateral, it's either uh, the, the bank will say, I'm, I'm not going to lend you 100%. So you need to bring some, keep some of your principal. So there's collateral there. It can be collateral in the form of a business asset. And um, so basically that whole relationship of debt goes on to collateral. And what is collateral? Collateral is somebody else's wealth. So again, this is something that the Quran explained in very simple terms, and we can now understand it when we understand modern finance. Okay. Now, just to recap, so in a very summarized way, what am I saying? What's the difference between debt and equity? Debt creates a lingering liability after the asset no longer exists. So it's either been, and notice these are all D words from debt, D. The asset has been devoured, devalued, depreciated, destroyed, disposed. Whatever reason, the asset doesn't exist anymore, but your liability stays. That is debt. Whereas, on equity, it is directly related to the business, to the asset of the business. And therefore, if the asset is destroyed, you as an equity holder will lose money. But if nobody has a liability at the end of the day. And that's the difference between debt and equity. Um, People think that interest can be used to cover inflation. Again, we need to understand that uh, interest uh, is not a, a cure for inflation. Actually, the inflation is caused by this uh, the debt scenario. So if you take a sample of uh, world, 10 people, Eight do not have the means to buy expensive assets. But when you pool them and you give them a loan facility, they're all competing for the same goods. So actually, this banking model creates the inflation. It's not something that is going to solve inflation. 
Um, so again, it's a, a, a detailed uh, example. I'm rushing through these because I know I'm uh, constrained for time. I will give you links to my presentation on YouTube, which explains it in a lot more detail and you can uh, pause and, and, and uh, you know, um, ponder over each of the points in much more detail uh, when I give you those uh, slides. Okay. Again, when we look at Islamic economics, we say you're not allowed to lend money. I, uh, uh, so it forces investment because people's choice is either to lend it or to invest. And again, the West, what it does is it reduces the interest rate to force money from the debt instruments into the equity instruments. Islam goes the whole hog and says, you know, it's banned from start. So, so effectively, at least in theory, both are looking at investment as the way forward, and both are looking at uh, how to get that investment. Going. Okay. So when we come up with the structured products, what is happening? We have transaction one, two, three put together. And then you have what I'm calling an equalizer transaction, a unilateral promise or a hiba that brings you back to the answer that interest would be giving you. And this is something that I'm challenging is not acceptable under Islamic principles. And the, what are the principles that are being violated? You won't have these transactions being done on market prices. They would be linked. Uh, they would be, um, uh, 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 so those are the two, two main reasons why you uh, will not be allowed to do these individual transactions. And really, the culprit in all of the Islamic banking products that we see today is this thing called unilateral promise. Are they linked or are they independent? All the Islamic banking books try and tell you that they, oh, it's an independent transaction. But you have to look into the detail. You have to ask yourself, how is it independent? Just because somebody wants to say it's independent? But no, look at the detail. On the one side, the unilateral promise document itself has reference to the transaction that it's linking itself to. It starts by saying, in consideration for the bank giving me a loan, I give this unilateral promise. So it actually starts by saying, when you ask people, would you ever do this transaction without the unilateral promise? And they all confirm under oath, no, no, we will never do this transaction without a unilateral promise. So again, uh, it's, it's not unilateral, it's, it's linked. It's always part of the audit checklist. And then you can do, a huge data analysis, you have a million leases done by Islamic banks, and statistically you can show that no case has ever where the rental has been done without this unilateral promise. And again, I put this challenge to the Sharia scholars, to all the bankers that I know, the Islamic bankers. I said, what evidence are you providing? I'm going to give you these four evidences that they're linked. What evidence are you providing? And I've not been provided any evidence to say they're independent other than saying, and actually Huna are two different things. You, you cannot just say just because something is possible, that's what is the reality. Today, when I'm giving you all these evidences which show you that it's linked, you still try and argue that it's not. And then this very important piece in which he linked all the people take riba, who give riba, who witness riba, and who uh, document riba as all being guilty. And here I'm asking the auditors, the CFOs, all the, here I consider the CFOs as the people who are writing that transaction. I consider the auditors as the ones that are witnessing the transaction and certifying it. So we have to take responsibility. It's not enough for the senior partner of one of the big four firms to, as it tells me, uh, we know it's not right, but, uh, you know, we do it. 
because it's not, Sharia scholar has said it's okay. But that's not it. You have to be an independent verifier, an independent considering what it is. Said. So I am saying this audience has to lead the change. We have to run that change. So it's not difficult to spot what's wrong with the structured uh, products that we get. There's a promise to buy, promise to sell, promise to equate, EBA, and you can find them in all of these Islamic products. It takes me two minutes to put my finger on it. Uh, so it's not, it's not difficult. And for example, I will just show you one example of Sukuks. Now, Sukuks, we think, is a panacea for all banking uh, uh, problems. And we constantly issue Sukuks. Now, this is a structure of a Sukuk. And look where the violations are. You can see that the government, when it sells the motorway, for example, there's no proper valuation. When it's taking the lease, there is no market value for the rental payments. When it's finally repurchasing it, it's repurchasing at the original cost. No point, you know, is, is it talking about what happened to the business in between and the new value. And the other thing is that you they're linked. So the purchase guarantee is linked to the financing. So you can find this very easily if you want to look and be an honest investigator. If you want to ignore it, then that's our choice. So when I say integrative approach, once you've understood that riba and interest are the same, once you've understood the basic business ethics of contracts, of market price, of linking transactions are the same, then you come and you say, well, do I need a whole new industry called Islamic finance? And the example I'm giving that in this country, in Pakistan, we set up a whole, whole Mudarba industry. We had, we had a Mudarba uh, SECP a commissioner, we had a Mudarba laws, we had a Mudarba everything. And when you analyze it, it's actually a simple limited liability company. Everything is the same. And the only difference is that you will not have the numerated financing arrangements. So a zero debt company is a Mudarba. So this is the type of thing, simple integration that I see is possible once we get over this understanding issue of what is Riba, is it really something different? So coming towards the very end now uh, of this part of my presentation, uh, why have we not progressed in the right direction? I think we've chosen to try and find solutions before understanding the problem, or not the problem, as I would say. There is no problem. But we've not even understood that, and we started to rush and to try and find solutions. And unfortunately, we're trying to build a sustainable industry of finance, Islamic finance, on a HILA. And even the um, scholars admit that this is a HILA. And we say Deen Asan hai, but it, again, I say it is not Asan to follow. It is Asan to understand. And following is a very big test for all of us. And Quran says that in 29, uh, two, uh, two and three, do people think that they will be left alone on saying we believe? And that they will not be tested? We will test them as we tested people below before them to see who's true and who's false. So all these solutions will be put in front of you as auditors, as CFOs, as, as, as bankers. And one of the answers we say is therefore we are okay if the Sharia scholar has okayed it. No, you have to understand and you will be tested. And there's going to be by definition, if you're asked to give something up, there is going to be some pain in that choice. So if there's no pain, there is no gain. And I finish with this uh, Mustafa Zaidi's share. Uh, if you look at the graphs, it's I'm not going to stop, but I, I feel this is a good time for us to reevaluate ourselves and to reconnect Islam.
on banking to pick up, put it back on the right track, because it really is now the easiest time to implement Islamic banking in its true form. Products have been commoditized, you've got rating systems, market prices are easily available, technology is lowering transaction costs, internet is lowering communication costs, market business models are being redefined, legal structures are being challenged, tax rules are being rewritten, and the rest is suffering from the effects of debt. So, if any time we're ever going to make an inroad into proper logical Islamic banking, this is the time to be doing it. So what is the integrative approach? Just to summarize, we call us a spade, a spade, and we be more honest to ourselves. Use the well-defined financial definition of interest, which is the same as riba, and use the well-developed rules and regulations in business, which are not in conflict with Islam at all. And then uh, these are the uh, practical uh, steps that we need to take because there are advantages of debt that have been built into the system by long history, let's say, of Western finance. And we will uh, talk about this in future uh, presentations, but um, I feel that our previous attempts have been declared as river by the courts. All neutral ex experts accept that the current products are in fact lending transactions, and I feel that both Pakistani and international courts will say that in the future. And we as the professionals of ICAP, PBA, as we have a lot to offer. And I, I do is end with the warning that was given 1400 years ago in the Quran, that don't try to confuse the two. Debt is very distinct from equity, and there's nothing new. You just need to be aware and wary. I'll stop here. Uh, let's take some questions and answers. Um, I have a part two, which uh, we'll uh, pick up some other time when we have more time. But I think we've covered enough for today, and there should be lots of questions and answers that we can ask and answer. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, amazing presentation. कुछ चीजों पे मुझे भी बड़ी क्लेरिटी आ गई बैंक की डेफिनेशन आपने बड़ी अच्छी बताई मेरी हमेशा से डेफिनेशन थी कि बैंक वो इदारा है व्हिच डील्स इन मनी दैट इज बाइंग एंड सेलिंग ऑफ मनी नाउ यू हैव एडेड टू दैट दैट देयर इज प्रॉमिसर टू पे बैक और ये जो डिपॉजिटर वाले रिलेशनशिप है अगर हम मॉडर्न डे की बैंकिंग की बात करें तो इट गोस विदाउट सेइंग इट्स अ डिपॉजिट टेकिंग इंस्टीट्यूशन और इस इस ये वाली जो चीज है इसके बगैर बैंकिंग नहीं हो सकती Thank you for that. And uh, that is established that riba, which is the interest. Hai. Or I have been part of your surveys as well on various forums. So, no one has yet to define it or yet difference it. They have given riba and interest. What is the difference? If there is, then let's take an example. So I agree with you. It's a, they, they, this is established that the riba is the interest. Or what we call it in Urdu, the definition of debt is the same as the interest of definition. Hai. लाइबिलिटी और इक्विटी भी बड़ा क्लियर हो गया और कुछ आपने डायग्राम्स की मदद से बताया तो ये तो बड़ा क्लियरली स्टेब्लिश हो जाता है कि अगर हम बात करें मॉडर्न डे बैंकिंग की तो इंटरेस्ट इज इक्वल टू रिबा नाउ प्रॉब्लम क्या है फिर ये मेरा एक सवाल होगा कि जब हम ये समझ जाते हैं और जो आईएफआरएस की डेफिनेशन है उसके हिसाब से जो इंटरेस्ट बनता है और जो कुरान में अगर हम देखें या हदीसों से हम देखते हैं तो भी वही डेफिनेशन बनती है नाउ व्हाट इज द प्रॉब्लम जो इस वक्त जो बैंकिंग हो रही है वो भी तो यही कह रहा है ना इसमें क्या आपको कोई लगता है कि ये इंटीग्रेटेड अप्रोच इस वक्त नहीं है क्योंकि आप इंटीग्रेटेड अप्रोच की बात कर रहे हैं सो so, मेरा पहला सवाल यही है कि फिर प्रॉब्लम क्या है क्या हाली अभी हम लोग इंटीग्रेटेड अप्रोच से नहीं चल रहे I think we, uh, I, I presume the question is ke Islamic banking ke jo products are more integrated. Maybe. Is that the question? Ji, where is the question? Ke is jo banking ho rahi hai, aur jo banking. Hum baat kar rahe, banking, you mean Islamic banking? Where is the problem area? 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 जब ये क्वेश्चन मैंने पूछा था कि व्हाट इज गिव मी एन एग्जांपल ऑफ ऑफ सम प्रोडक्ट्स दैट इस्लाम सेज इज रिबा बट इज नॉट इंटरेस्ट अंडर आईएफआरएस 
So nobody has been able to come up with an answer for that. But if you ask the same question in a different way, or, or a different question in a different way, which is, can you give me any example of what the West calls riba, uh, interest, and yet we are saying it's not interest. Hmm. So now, the answer is that as many Islamic products that we have today, when we check them, karte hain, they all fall under the definition of interest. Hmm. If they fall under the definition of interest, and we are saying it's not interest, then we have a very peculiar situation that the unconcerned is saying that it's interest and we're not saying interest. Do you, you understand that? that the problem is that a neutral person, and the example I give this to, to people, it's like giving a child, six-year-old child, a deck of cards. Every six-year-old child, unless he's colorblind, he will be able to sift it time and time again and every time. So they, he doesn't have a problem. Now, if you then start saying for each red, you're going to get so much money, for each black, you're going to get so much money, then you'll start the confusion. You will try and say, So that's the point. That when you look at it from a very neutral angle, it's interest. And somehow we want to convert it into non-interest. I've tried to show with each product, where is the problem? And the two problems are always the same. One is off-market pricing, and two is linked transactions, which we don't believe. Despite a million uh, big data that is in today's world, in a million transactions, we don't have separate and we say it's not separate. So this is the denial process that we are still in. When you try and integrate this, uh, uh, interestingly, this dichotomy is actually used by, um, by the Islamic banking industry themselves. When they want to get a banking license, they have managed to convince the Bank of England, unless you tell us that you have a promise, I don't have a problem, I don't have to give you a license. You operate your business if you don't have a promise to return the depositors money. I'm getting no, it is a collective investment account. Jawab Kate, it's a collective investment account. The Bank of England says, okay, there's no promise, you don't need a banking license. So, what do we do? The banking industry, Islamic banking industry, actually puts a paper together, goes to the Bank of England and shows actually it is a real promise. It's just that um, it's not worded in that way. And then they get convinced and they give them a, a, a banking license. The same approach is taken when they need tax breaks. What do they do? They go to the UK and the Irish and, and the American uh, tax authorities and tell them that this is interest and should be tax deductible. They say, no, no, it's not interest. You tell me, you're telling me it's not interest. So they put paper like and go convince that actually it is interest and should be treated the same. So on the one side, we try and convince Muslims that it is not interest. And they're happy to be convinced because they are already saying that under IFRS. So when they say, okay, you're saying it's interest, let me ask my accountant. So he calls his accountant. His accountant says, yes, under IFRS it is interest. So that is the problem, that we are creating products that are selling to Muslims purely because these are Muslims who want to follow the faith. And what we are selling them is a mispackaged, mislabeled product, unfortunately. So unless we, uh, and, and again, the, pro, the key point I'm trying to make is that we have an opportunity because the same definition can be used and you'll know that the best that are coming up constantly with interest, non-interest products. Because they have the features of being equity based. But we still want to be, we are guarantee, 
उसके साथ कुछ एक्स्ट्रा मिल जाए एंड वी हैप्पी विद दैट सो दैट्स द आंसर टू दैट सो दैट्स व्हाई इट्स नॉट इंटीग्रेटेड इट्स नॉट इंटीग्रेटेड बिकॉज़ आई थिंक वी आर मिसलेबलिंग एंड अनफॉर्चूनेटली इट डजंट स्टैंड अप टू एनी any test at all and this is the example i've given you unilateral promise kisi bhi naam ke alawa usme koi unilateralism hai nahi 100% linkage hai it is proven by action it is proven by the letter of the word of the document it is proven by the data ab aur kya cheez aapko main prove karunga ki yaar ye linked hai and you keep saying it linked link कुछ क्वेश्चंस ऑडियंस के हैं आई विल ट्राई टू टेक सम फरहान ताहिर का एक क्वेश्चन है और उसी से रिलेटेड उनका एक दूसरा क्वेश्चन है मैं दोनों पढ़ देता हूं देन यू कैन रिलेट व्हाई इंटरेस्ट वाज नॉट बैन फ्रॉम डे वन एंड वी वेटेड फॉर सम टाइम ये इनका पहला क्वेश्चन है इसी का दूसरा पार्ट है कि लिमिटिंग पर्सनल लाइब्रेटी थ्रू अ लिमिटेड लाइब्रेटी कंपनी इज इट अलाउड अंडर इस्लाम because a company is only a legal entity which islam does not recognize per se your comments on this sure on the first uh, point ke ji why it was not done to be honest abhi bhi we are not clear on what is interest or not interest so even if you try to ban it what will you be banning so my presentation hopefully is is to start that debate on what should be banned and inshallah i have got answers for the state uh, the supreme court of pakistan based on this logic so so the answer is that agar ban abhi tak nahi hua even today if you are not clear what you are going to ban you are going to have this problem all the time on the limited liability concept uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, comment uh, the current islamic banking has accepted uh, the uh, limited liability concept Though the West is now starting to challenge that through all the trusts and all the um, look-throughs that they are introducing, so this limited liability concept is being reined back in. So here, yeah, this is an an area of development that we can all look at and and do more work on. Okay. Next question. Ah, uh, because it is a comment. Ah. Mr. Tariq Akbar Saab ka appreciate the efforts of Caspred IBP CFO club today's topic is really a need of the day and should be done more frequently to make it parallel to the conventional banking rather than having a booth uh, in the financial sector thank you akbar saab for your suggestion aapka koi comment hai is pe wo ye keh rahe hain ki hum mazid se mazid isko islamic finance ki hum baat kare i myself have uh, a lot more material that i want to share so hopefully people are interested we can uh, follow up sessions kar sakte hain acha imran hussain ke do teen comments hain usko main summarize karta hu uh, please refer the islamic school of thought and ijma of ulama who say there is no conflict between islam and modern finance conventional particularly कन्वेंशनल फाइनेंस इन पर्टिकुलर इसी से रिलेट पे करते हैं दूसरा क्वेश्चन दूसरा इनका कॉमेंट है इस्लामिक आइडियोलॉजी इस्लामिक आइडियोलॉजी काउंसिल ऑफ पाकिस्तान इज डिक्लेयर इंटरेस्ट एज रिबा एंड नो इस्लामिक स्कॉलर हैज डिफर्ड एनी कॉमेंट ऑन दिस ये कह रहे हैं कि ऑलरेडी इस्लामिक आइडियोलॉजी काउंसिल भी ये कह चुका है कि इंटरेस्ट इन रिबा से तो फिर उनका फिर उसी से मेरा ख्याल पहला पार्ट निकलता है कि देर इज नो कॉन्फ्लिक्ट Uh, in Islam versus modern finance. Mm -hmm. It's good. I'm I'm glad that uh, people are saying that. The problem is in the solutions that we are coming up with. So while we may say that, but the products that we are accepting as Islamic non-interest bearing products under modern finance have shown you that they will all fail and they will all be interest based, whether under IFRS 15, 16. Um, Under banking license, under the tax regime, in some way they fail, or they pass. Depending on if you want the advantages, so you you try and say they passed. But in effect, they all fail that test of of being interest, and yet we say they're not interest. So when he says that uh, everyone is saying the same, the honest answer is we are not. We are putting products together which fail the the. the 
तो फिर तो सेम नहीं है ना और सेम नहीं है ठीक हो गया एक और क्वेश्चन है विदाउट डिस्क्लोजिंग इज नेम ही वांट्स टू आस्क व्हाई डू पीपल इग्नोर सब्सटेंस ओवर फॉर्म व्हेन इट कम्स टू द इस्लामिक फाइनेंस तो हम सब्सटेंस ओवर फॉर्म को क्यों इग्नोर कर देते हैं वैसे तो हम आई एफ की बात करते हैं इस्लामिक फाइनेंस आती है बात तो फिर हम डिफरेंट स्टैंडर्ड और दूसरी चीजों पर चले जाते हैं वाई इज इट दैट i i think the question should be asked of the sharia scholars because everything i have said today is all about substance i just didn't use that word uh, deliberately because it gives a a level ke ji sab kuch substance which i i wanted to talk about the substance so you will have seen i talked about each and every concept rather than talking in a generic word called substance so i agree with the with the writer that uh, substance may it isn't the case but i've tried to go beyond the word substance and show people today what that substance in reality is whether it is in uh, uh whether it's linked to transactions whether it's off market pricing these are the things that show you whether the substance is the same or not and that's what i've tried to do i totally agree with the gentleman i am on his side i am not uh, uh, but i didn't want to use the word substance over form because it just need, we need to talk about more detail so my presentation was about substance it was going to the essence of the substance so so yes i agree with thank you ab mujhe usme yaad aa gayi ek hadith hai inna mal amalu bin niyat तो बेसिकली मैं इसको यूं इंटरप्रेट करता हूं तो फॉर्म डिपेंड्स ऑन द सब्सटेंस द फॉर्म डिपेंड्स ऑन द सब्सटेंस मतलब कहने के ये इन नंबर अमाल बिन नियात तो जो आपके एक्शंस हैं वो बेसिकली आपके सब्सटेंस को रिप्रेजेंट करते हैं इन फैक्ट द प्रॉब्लम इज दैट इट्स द सेम सुन्नत दैट द अदर साइड यूज दे दे से कि हमारी नियत सही है now uh, one of the slides which i rushed off i was asking this question can when you evaluate niyat is the niyat of us who are trying to do islamic banking in the form that we are doing is the niyat to avoid interest or is our niyat to take interest islamically kyunki agar avoid karna hai to wo to aasan hai we have moved from that near to follow the quran and avoid interest but we have now moved our near to take interest islamically and then that's where the problem is agi shahid raza sahab ka question hai dear ayaz sahab uh, your questions are valid but issue is that the unilateral promise uh, is there in practice and there is no other alternative for the time being to practice islamic finance in a different way your comments is pe to uh, i have the follow up presentations which cover what needs to be done to implement islamic banking and my message to him is that uh, um, over the last 30 years that i have been doing these presentations the west is moving towards products that meet islamic uh, banking or islamic finance criteria much more than were there 15 years ago so hum unki banking ko follow kar rahe they are moving away from banking so this whole concept of fair mark to market fair value accounting ye sari cheeze wo hain jo ke islamic principles ko meet karti hain so inshallah if you want so i have more presentations follow up presentations in which i give solutions today was only to talk about riba and get to the integrity if you understood it that's very good and now he's looking for solutions inshallah i will take him and everybody all the audience through the solutions in future presentations that would be great ya yeah, so we can make it a series uh in fact caspit ne bhi request ki hai ki jab university open ho jayegi so they also want to invite you uh, physically तो ऑन प्रेमाइसिस जो है वो जाहिर है फैकल्टी भी होगी और फिर स्टूडेंट्स भी होंगे तो जाहिर है कि यूनिवर्सिटी से ही तो हमारी बुनियाद खड़ी होती है तो अगर हम वहाँ से स्टार्ट करते हैं एज वेल एज हम चूंकि लिंक कर रहे हैं इंडस्ट्री एंड अकेडमिया को तो अकेडमिया और इंडस्ट्री को अगर हम साथ मिलकर लेके चलते हैं वी कैन अंडरस्टैंड वी कैन डिबेट ऑन दिंग न्यूट्रली हम उसको समझते हैं 
सो वाई नॉट देर इज ऑलवेज जो भी है आपका रिविजिट तो कोई भी चीज की जा सकती ना अकले कुल तो कोई भी नहीं है तो जहाँ पे हम पहुंचे हैं उन पर मैंने काफी स्कॉलर्स के भी पढ़े हैं इवन जजमेंट्स में है जो नाइनटी नाइन के जजमेंट थे कि हम रिविजिट करने के लिए तैयार हैं लेकिन इस दफा स्टार्ट तो होने दो लेकिन वो नाइनटी नाइन के जजमेंट्स अब ऑलमोस्ट ट्वेंटी टू ईयर्स हो गए सो नाउ आई थिंक इट इज टाइम टू रिविजिट नवीद इकबाल साहब का क्वेश्चन है आई ऑल्सो आई एम ऑल्सो स्केप्टिकल दैट सम इस्लामिक बैंकिंग इन पाकिस्तान is whether actually islamic and interest free or not and uh, he wants to ask i think uh, whether we have a true islamic banking system in pakistan as it should be i would again challenge um, which the bank of england governor did 20 years ago why do you need a banking license उनका अपना बैंकिंग रेगुलेटर आपसे कह रहा है व्हाई डू यू नीड अ बैंकिंग लाइसेंस 95 परसेंट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड्स बिजनेस इज ओपन टू यू विदाउट अ बैंकिंग लाइसेंस इफ यू वांट टू बी एन एसेट मैनेजमेंट कंपनी यू कैन बी दैट यू वांट टू बी एन इक्विटी कंपनी यू कैन बी दैट यू वांट टू बी माइक्रोसॉफ्ट यू कैन बी दैट एवरीथिंग इज अवेलेबल व्हाई डू वांट टू बी अ बैंक इफ यू डोंट प्रॉमिस अ रिटर्न ऑफ द प्रिंसिपल यू डोंट नीड टू बी अ बैंक यू डोंट नीड टू बी टाइड बट वी वांट टू गेट some thing that we think is an advantage of being a bank i agree with you agar aapko deposit taking institution nahi banana you don't need a license mm-hmm. yes agar deposit taking nahi hai to uh, banking ka bhi license nahi hai aur mainly jo nbfcs jo deposit taking hai wo bhi license ki zarurat nahi hai so uh-huh. it's all about deposit taking i agree with you yeah and second way what i'll say is that If you're not a bank, doesn't mean that आपके ऊपर पाबंदियां नहीं होंगी आपके ऊपर तो every asset management company has lots of regulations to do with customer money protection. ठीक है and look at what's happened to those people who have violated asset management principles and and mixed funds recently. उसमें एक जोश बहुत बड़ा मेड ऑफ के नाम से फंड था so you know they mix the funds of of clients and and customers and there's a case of a pakistani famous person as well i remember uh, so there are lots of regulations that will still apply to you it doesn't mean that banking ke regulations nahi hai to aap free for all no there is consumer protection there is going to be uh, customer money protection there is going to be libel there is going to be uh, uh, you know uh, marketing uh, uh, honesty bahut si cheeze hain and and all of those are islamic so we are not at the end of the road by saying ke bank bano to you okay no you still have to do business in a very ethical way you have to do business in in a safe way you have to be honest with and and risk profile them according to their desires uh kuch quick questions hain time hamare paas short hai so i would like to cover as many as possible uh quickly uh, riyaz sunara has asked isn't a conventional bank more islamic than a islamic bank in pakistan okay i want to restrict the discussion today at least to riba okay and on that count no and neither is islamic banking uh, riba free either uh, other matters of islam i want to deliberately leave out because they are common with the rest of the world our ethics our, uh, our morality uh, you know so all of those uh, things are are, are as, uh, as important uh mohammad hanif idris is the conclusion that, that the islamic banking products being offered in pakistan are actually not islamic so actually he is wants a judgment uh, kind of thing he is uh, talking about conclusion i will invite him to come to my next presentation in which i talk through each of the products and i show how to look at a product and discuss uh, evaluate whether it is islamic whether in pakistan or the world so even we look at sukooks we look at uh, asset management products we look at every product inshallah and once we've got this working model of what interest is how structured products are to be looked at then we have the testing mechanism to test all the products inshallah we will go through each product and test it on the same uh, 
and I, uh, when I say integrative, uh, also scientific way of testing. Another quick question, Tasmiya Muntaha, could Islamic banking prevent the financial crisis? Yes, absolutely. Because, they, see, the key point is that um, a lot of the problems start from people borrowing money. If you didn't have money, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. Now, some people think that's a bad thing. But in reality, what is being learned today is that leveraging is causing the problem. And we try and keep finding, thinking that there's going to be a solution to that from leveraging. So yes, I believe very much, and so does the West, that, that leveraging is a problem. And then even looking at leveraging in non-banking situations. So it's called non-bank leveraging. So leveraging is the problem. Banking is one part of that. Ji, uh, Muzammil Saber ka sawal hai, what is the way forward on this? And what is the appetite in the Islamic banking industry to accept the products that are interest-based and reinvent this industry? I would go the other way. And I, I did an, uh, a study of American economy. Uh, and, I decided, and I divided the things that I consider Islamic and that doesn't, I mean, in my strict definition. So, and, and I looked at that and almost 85% of the American economy was interest-free, not, uh, was not an interest-based uh, economy. And that was 20 years ago. In the last 15, 10 years, the finance, the fintech, the um, the tech companies, they've all shown how you can do products without borrowing. Jitni iswar dunya ki badi kampaniya hai, they're all non-borrowers. Inshallah, my uh, future presentations will take people through. See, once you take your blinders off, it's amazing the view that you get. It's just that we have put blinders on, we keep thinking that banking is the best thing and we need to copy it. You need to get away from that thought and say, maybe banking is not the best thing and we should not be copying it. Now let's look at all the other products that are available. Riyaz Chunaraka again, Savane, the returns on Islamic banks in Pakistan uh, are significantly through sukooks, which you have proved is un-Islamic. Then how come Mudarba distribution is Islamic? There are two, uh, the, see when you have a balance sheet, you have the asset side and you have the liability side. The liability side of the balance sheet consists of equity and liabilities. Now, the problem with the, every Islamic bank is that the problem is not on the liability, uh, on the liability side. All the assets are, are, are uh, structured in such a way that you have a problem. So Mudarba is okay because it's uh, it, it's profit sharing on the liability side. Sukuk as a concept is okay. The concept of Sukuk is okay. The assets of the Sukuk hold are un-Islamic. So as I showed in the Mudarba situation, it's an LLB without debt. So is Sakuk, so is Musharka, so is all of these products are perfectly okay. The problem arises that we take the money on these forms and then we deploy them into structured products, which are interest. That's why it becomes haram in my, my mind. Not because the Sukuk structure is wrong, absolutely not. The Sukuk structure is, an, is a unit trust structure, which I'm saying is haram. It's the products that they are buying, which is a structured financing lease. Sell and lease back arrangement, which is which is the haram part. Okay. Achha, ek last uh, detailed question. Hai, aur uske baat, sare jo questions are repetitive. Hai. Unke baat either ya to ja chuke hai. Products ke mein baat karte hai, let's have another session with Mr. Rayaz Ahmed and then we will talk about products. So, ye ek, uh, last question I want to take from you. 
थोड़ा सा डिटेल क्वेश्चन है एंड द क्वेश्चन इज फ्रॉम मिस्टर सालिम महमूद मे बी ही सालिम महमूद हु वॉज इन एच पी एल आई डोंट नो नेम से अपेयर नहीं हो रहा वो नेम इज सालिम महमूद इज इट पॉसिबल टू हैव कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ इस्लामिक बैंकिंग विच ओनली टैक्स करंट अकाउंट डिपॉजिट विद सेंट्रल बैंक on non interest basis and provides payment services to the customers and charge uh, service charges service fee simply okay. providing custody of the current account ye ek part hai uski question ka okay. aur dusra question wo pooch rahe hain ke another question is that whether negative interest rate and charging amount to the depositors should have any implications on this theory which you presented today over to you pass okay the first point is that um, when you take current account uh, and you're trying to promise to return the same amount back to the depositor now that is the starting the promise to return is the start of the problem and that's where the bank of england comes in and says here you have made a promise to the depositor that you will give the principal back there is no promise about interest or anything so you are promising to give the principal back now if you take that money and you employ it in any other method of investing that does not promise to give you returns back how are you going to give somebody's principal back theek hai so the question that the bank of england is not bothered about the interest their problem starts with the promise so if i take um, uh, th- um, uh, let's say a million people 100 pounds each and i've got 10 um, uh, 100 million pounds in my bank and i do a trading business i do um, uh, another type of business i do this um, service business and i lose the money how do i return to the depositor so that's where the bank of england then comes in or the bank regulator comes in and says i'm not interested in whether you're giving interest or not you have to conduct your business in such a way that you can grip the principal back and all the banking regulations come in to ensure that so you have to have matching so if you have taken a promise to give uh, deposits on the promise to give it back you have to match them with your assets that are also promising to give you back तो ये मिसमैच जो बता रहे हैं कि मैंने डिपॉजिट ले लिया नॉन इंटरेस्ट बेरिंग और मैंने उसको बैंकिंग सर्विसेज में लगा दिया दैट क्रिएट्स अ मिसमैच व्हिच वुड नॉट बी एक्सेप्टेबल टू द रेगुलेटर यस इफ यू टुक द मनी ऑन एन इन्वेस्टमेंट बेसिस एंड टोल्ड योर डिपॉजिटर दैट लुक दिस इज मनी दैट आई एम गोइंग टू इन्वेस्ट इन service business of 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 remittances or whatever banking services that you want to do and if i make money i'll keep it if i lose money you will lose money the bank of england will be okay so the answer to his question is is that this is not possible because the problem starts with the promise to the depositor and the matching has to be there to make sure that that promise can be delivered on the bank of england kasre gay wo काम है पूरी दुनिया में कि जी कैन यू मीट दैट प्रॉमिस टू रिटर्न द प्रिंसिपल सो दैट्स द आंसर टू दैट क्वेश्चन नेगेटिव इंटरेस्ट रेट इज समथिंग दैट वी ऑल बीन वेरी मच यूज्ड टू व्हेन वी डिस्काउंटिंग जिसको कहते हैं तो उसी की एक असन है सो आई डोंट सी देयर इज एनी मेजर फंडामेंटल चेंज दैट कम्स वी हैव हैड नेगेटिव वी हैव हैड डिस्काउंटिंग फॉर अ वेरी लॉन्ग टाइम the the other thing that one once we get to the products we will look at is the banking can be split into two parts one is service and one is asset management so in fact if anything the banking is being attacked by both sides the asset managers that uh, shahzad saab works for and the fintech that is on the other side both of those are attacking the banks and to me the banks will disappear so this problem of islamic banks will not be a problem in the future if we follow through what i am saying inshallah uh, aya sab baat to ye hai na ke uh, interest free banking hame puri duniya mein nazar aati hai but uske sath islam ka word nahi attached hai 
so there are a lot of examples aapne bhi apni examples mein bataya ke 85% of the banking uh, which is islamic no, or sorry uh, if i can link what you're saying there's a, there's a, there's this slight confusion and the answer that i gave to salim sir is that you cannot have the bank that is islamic you cannot even have an interest free bank in islamic because of the matching problem so your entity has to move away from being a bank i e you have to stop giving that promise of returning the deposit and that as i saw 20 years ago by bank of england governor ne aapki apni conference mein aake aapko samjhaya aur hame samajh nahi aaya sure सिर्फ एक चीज मैं अपनी अंडरस्टैंडिंग अपनी कुरान का एक तर्जुमा आपसे शेयर करता हूँ कि चौदह सौ साल पहले जब अल्लाह ताला ने ये आयत नाजिल की जिसका मफहम कुछ ऐसा है कि अल्लाह ताला हलाल करता है बै को डेट एंड हराम करता है रिबा को तो इसका मतलब इन ये जो दो लफ्ज हैं ट्रेड और ये रिबा इनमें ही सारे मायने छुपे हुए हैं तो ट्रेड ही करना है हमें बाकी किसी भी फॉर्म में जाएंगे तो वो जाहिर है कि वो फिर हम कहेंगे कि किसी तरह से रिबाक के अंदर ट्रेड कर दो तो वो पॉसिबल नहीं है क्योंकि ये दोनों इतना डिस्टिंक्ट हैं म्यूचुअली एक्सक्लूसिव हैं कि इनके दोनों की ना वो कोई कोई भी चीज आप करेंगे तो उसमें प्रॉब्लम होगा या तो आप बताएं कि ये हमने बताया हुआ है और इसमें इतना परसेंटेज जो है वो ये शामिल है या तो आप परसेंटेज वाइज करें क्योंकि अदरवाइज कोई भी कोशिश होगी कि हम कन्वर्ट कर दें रिबा इन बे तो मेरा तो नहीं ख्याल क्योंकि अगर ये आयत को मैं सही समझाऊँ तो ये बहुत ही दोनों इतने डिस्टिंक्ट इतने म्यूचुअली एक्सक्लूसिव चीज हैं इनमें कोई भी ओवरलैपिंग चीज नहीं हो सकती है विद दैट थैंक यू वेरी मच सर जो बहुत सारे क्वेश्चंस हैं उनके लिए मैं कहूंगा बहुत सारे आपके क्वेश्चंस के जवाब इस प्रेजेंटेशन में और जो पोस्ट जो क्यू एन ए था उसमें कवर्ड है और बहुत सारे क्वेश्चन आपके प्रोडक्ट रिलेटेड है तो प्रोडक्ट रिलेटेड एक और सेशन करेंगे हम इनशाला वेन एवर ही टाइम तो थैंक यू वेरी मच सर आपके कुछ कमेंट्स हो हमारे लिए या ऑडियंस के लिए थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी एंड आई होप दैट इट इज टेकन इन अ पॉजिटिव वे बिकॉज़ व्हाट आई एम ट्राइंग टू डू इज चैलेंज अस टू ओपन आवर आईज एंड सी रादर देन लुक फॉर अ सॉल्यूशन टू समथिंग दैट वी वुड लाइक टू हैपन वो नहीं होगा वी विल हैव टू ओपन आवर आईज एंड द गुड थिंग अबाउट दिस इज दैट वंस यू गेट इनटू दिस frame of mind that islam actually is saying the right thing and i can go into any court of law in the world and say ye interest hai ye interest nahi hai aapki apni definition mein ye interest hai so let's now start talking about that and some of the my presentation start with that i talk to the west and i say look you yourself are saying that uh, we need uh, thinly capitalized Uh, legislation tax ka most complex legislation is called thinly capitalized companies legislation aur wo anti avoidance hai to main unse khud puchta hu ki why do you need this legislation because there are advantages in debt that you don't want to be abused the first point aapne khud maan liya there are advantages in debt wo kahan se aaye unko aap remove kare and to abuse or which means that you're trying to avoid it so some times we can talk to the west and find that some of their systems are also needing to be addressed but like i said i have seen tremendous uh, movement away from banks and banking in the west and inshallah we should follow that model rather than trying to copy what they are doing away with so unfortunately we are copying what they are themselves saying ke yaar ye alag ho gaya thank you very much sir wonderful session on the behalf of casbet team i would like to thank you and i would like to special thank to shahzad dedi sahab as well for your kind consideration and cooperation and wo jo abhi baat discuss ho rahi thi ki ye ek topic aisa nahi hai ek wo wali baat hai ek samandar hai abhi to humne ek ek bilkul jo asal cheez jis pe jhagda hai riba ka asal mein wo cheez thodi si clear ho jaye to baaki sari cheeze clear hongi ek series of session is pe zarur hona chahiye और बहुत सारे लोगों को जो इस चीज पे भी बहुत सारे ऐसे सवाल के जो कंफ्यूजन होती है कि बैंक का कॉन्सेप्ट इस्लाम में नहीं है और जब हम उसको लेके चलते हैं या फिर हम जैसे कायबोर्ड को एज ए प्राइस इंडेक्स यूज कर रहे हैं इस्लामिक बैंक्स के अंदर तो वहां पे भी बहुत सारे एक एज ए ले बहुत सारी कन्फ्यूजन होती है कि बेशक वो प्राइज ए प्राइस इंडेक्स यूज हो रहा है या 
इस्लामिक बैंक की अभी अपने इंडेक्सिंग नहीं है तो वो बहुत ऐसी सारी कंफ्यूजन क्रिएट हो जाती है जहाँ पे वही वाली चीज है कि मिक्स मैच हो जाता है कि इंटरेस्ट है या प्रॉफिट है और वो कंफ्यूजन स्टिल अभी भी है तो बहुत सारी क्यूरीज दूर होने के लिए इनशाला वी विल कंटिन्यू द सीरीज ऑफ सेशन विद द कॉपरेशन ऑफ द अर्शदात साहब एंड वी विल इन्वाइट यू अगेन इनशाला थैंक यू सो मच सर थैंक यू सो मच वंडरफुल सेशन Thank you very much. And, and I personally enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, Noshin. Ah, uh, your time ka ap most of all patiently ah uh, apne pura session. Yeah, I, I'm really enjoyed. Sir, मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगा सर की present interesting भी थी फिर question answer session. बल्कि अभी तो बहुत सारे कुछ अपने भी मेरे भी दिमाग में और बहुत सारी चीजें थी मैंने कहा इन्शाल्लाह वो फिर इन्शाल्लाह session हम रखेंगे उसमें discuss करेंगे. We'll go into detail. I think the whole idea was to address this one single question of Riba. आप सबका बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया सो लेट्स प्लान फॉर दीरीज थैंक यू आई सब अगेन आई थोरली इंजॉय देशन विदाउट एग्जेशन में बता रहा हूँ और जो दो तीन चीजें मेरी बड़ी क्लियर हो गई रिगार्डिंग डेफिनेशन ऑफ द बैंक एंड जो इंटरेस्ट और जो रिबा है उसमें अगर कोई डिफरेंस कहीं जहन में था भी तो वो अब नहीं है जी बिल्कुल सही आपने कही बल्कि एक दो चीजें मेरे अपने पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से भी जैसे सर ने कहा कि एसिड बेस्ड फाइनेंसिंग इसको मत आप समझें खाली तो ये वाली चीज भी बहुत अच्छी मतलब है चले सर इनशाला कंटिन्यू करेंगे इनशाला फ्यूचर थैंक यू सो मच पार्टिसिपेंट्स से रिक्वेस्ट है इफ दे लव द कॉन्टेंट ऑफ दिस प्रेजेंटेशन प्लीज स्प्रेड दिस वर्ड ताकि और भी लोगों को पता चले कॉन्सेप्ट uh, के बारे में ये रिकॉर्डिंग मौजूद रहेगी फेसबुक पे सी एफ ओ लीक पे भी और कैसपिट पे भी आप इसको लेटर ऑन भी दोबारा रिविजिट कर सकते हैं एंड एनी बडी हु इज अटेंडेड टूडे एंड वॉन्ट्स अ सर्टिफिकेट तो आप अपनी एक रिक्वेस्ट दे दें या तो कैसपिट की मैनेजमेंट को दे दें या सी एफ ओ क्लब को आप एक ई मेल कर दीजिए तो इनशाला बहुत जल्द आपको एक सर्टिफिकेट भी मिल जाएगा जी आया साहब आप कुछ कहना चाहते हैं ये कह रहा था कि आई विल आल्सो पुट अप लिंक्स ऑन द सेम फोरम फॉर टू ऑफ द डिटेल्ड प्रेजेंटेशंस जो इसी चीज को और डिटेल में डिस्कस करता है सो एनीथिंग दैट आई हैड टू रश थ्रू टुडे इफ पीपल वांट टू सी इट इन देयर ओन टाइम दे कैन डू दैट दैट वुड बी ग्रेट आया साहब अगर आज ही शेयर कर दें तो हम एक रिमाइंडर ईमेल चला देंगे वो ऑटो जनरेटेड ईमेल जाएगी तो वो कल सबके पास लिंक पहुंच जाएंगे ठीक है ग्रेट Thank you thank you okay With thank that. you so much allah hafiz allah hafiz